Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Martel Teasley from the University of Utah College of Social Work. Uh, I'll start out uh, followed by my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Spencer uh, from the University of Washington, and followed by a doc student in JD, Melissa Bartholomew from Boston College. And uh, as many of you may know, we are developing a text on racism in the Grand Challenge, the 13th Grand Challenge. And so we were asked to do <clears throat> an invited symposium. Although there is a known litany of documentation on race and racism from ancient times to the present, according to author Ibram Kenda, the first acknowledgement of the concept of race comes from, the French, from Frenchman Jacques de Brise in his 1481 poem, The Hunt, referring to hunting dogs. Race first appeared in the dictionary in 1606 uh, by French diplomat Jean Nicot, who stated in his entry that race means descent. Quote, it is said that a man, a horse, a dog, or another animal is from good or bad race, unquote. Today, although there are varied definitions of race, it is stated to be a pseudoscientific concept developed in the 18th century to justify the gross dehumanization of global human populations for, exp for exploitation and domination by an ascribed superior group better known as white people of European descent. The ideological formation of race in America starts with the European movement and rapid expansion into the so-called New World as a developed psychological justification for hierarchically classifying human beings for the purpose of legal and institutional control and the assignment of value. According to Kinda, thanks to the malleability of race as a concept in Western Europe, the British were free to lump the multi-ethnic Native American and the multi-ethnic Africans into the same racial groups. It is important to understand the interlink between race and racism. As a concept created to support and privileged whiteness, the concept of race has biological and social dimensions, according to Milana Karinga, as he states, in, re in reference to the physical features, race is a biological category used to distinguish different kinds of human beings. However, it is clearly important to the concept of race that the color of people's skin, the texture of their hair, the size of their noses and lips, etc. The key to this concept is to assign social value and meaning to these features, for the social meaning of race is the core of its definition, the raison d'etre, the reason for its pseudoscientific intervention and social imposition. Therefore, race, stripped of all this pseudoscientific mystification and contrived meanings, is essentially a, psych a social biological concept constructed to assign human worth and social status using Europeans as the paradigm. Karinga goes on to say that, to say that race is specious is to deny the reality of it in its social embrace and social consequences. Indeed, it is important to remember that concepts are not simply real and imaginary descriptions of reality, for, the act, for they actually become forms of reality itself when people embrace their, these ideals and use them to inform, explain, and direct their lives, and such is the history of race and the system for which it is the foundation stone, that is racism. Racism is the exercise of power and domination by a racial group over another racial group, frequently and consistently resulting in the disadvantage and domination of groups at the expense of the dominating group. Further, the contribution of social, political, economic, and personal inequalities created and enforced along, or, or enforced along the lines of race. There are three basic ways in which racism functions in our society and in others. One, we call it the three eyes of racism. One is the creation of ideology, of domination, and social worth based on skin color and anatomical features. Second is race as an imposition, to, which is above all the imposition of violence against targeted people. It begins as an interruption in the destruction and appropriation of their histories and productive capacity in racial terms through assault, conquest, occupation, annexation, 
disposition, segregation, apartheid, deculturalization, exploitation, genocide, enslavement, holocaust, and other forms of massive violence and oppression. The third is to institutionalize the ideology and the imposition as a form of maintenance in the domination of non-dominant groups. All three, that is, the ideology, the imposition, and the institution of racism are in place in a racist society. Part of the imposition and the maintenance of racism is the problem of racialized people of color having to define their, existing as as their existence as racial beings. Of course, this, particular, this practice within itself speaks to a level of privilege because it subliminally leaves whites outside of the identity politics of race and their far-reaching social implications. One of the major implications of race is found in the formation of social identities based on race and the ensuing identity politics. Presuppositions that underscore the identity politics of race makes people socially accountable for who they are as racialized beings. Take, for example, President Barack Obama, who had to tread carefully due to his race as a campaign tactic in order to promote him as president of all Americans his social identity that linked him to the African-American experience was purposely subdued. <clears throat> he had to show the distance between himself and African-Americans like no white president before him or after him for that matter, had to with their social identities and racial heritage. As black studies scholar Mark Christian writes, quote, with Obama coming from a historical outgroup, he had to show the powerful in-group distinct signs of objectivity and distance from African-Americans when operating as president, unquote. Using a present day example, racialized identity politics has moved Prince Harry and Meghan Markle to declare the abdication, of, uh, their abdication as senior roles as the Duke and Duchess of Saxon. It appears that talent, good looks, and acting as a kind person of character and worth is not enough to overcome Meghan Markle's mixed, rich, mixed racial heritage. Apparently, the British press has continually racialized her experience, that is, questioning her fit as a member of British royalty. In one blatant example, after Harry and Marco's son was born, the BBC, a BBC radio host, who was eventually fired, tweeted, Royal baby leaves hospital, which is a statement above a black and white 1920 picture of a baby chimp holding the hands with a humble white couple. Another problem with racialized people, whether we realize it or not, as part of the ideology, ideology of race, is when we make the statement or refer to a person or a group as people of color, which implies the presupposition that we are not speaking of white people as part of this umbrella term. This practice restricts whites from racial regulation as people of color while simultaneously separating whites from color. Based on this condition, people of color must continuously negotiate the trappings of race and identity politics while the powerful in-group is void of the negative stigma associated with racialized identity politics unless it chooses to do so, which is essentially on its own terms. Consequently, the sheer power of whiteness as a standalone category compels many non-white people of lighter hue to by some means free themselves from the albatross of racialized identity politics by gravitating towards whiteness as a preferred state of mind and consciousness, consciousness, and I might add, often in attempts at physical features. Focusing on the obvious hypocrisy of racialized thinking, author James Baldwin writes in The Fire Next Time, quote, as long as you are white, I'm black, unquote. Here, Baldwin flips the responsibility of human categorization by race to highlight and examine the normality of unquestionable whiteness. He notes that there can be no real examination of race until and unless whites examine themselves and their pretense of innate superiority. Baldwin warns, quote, if we who can scarcely be considered a white nation, now he's writing this in the 60s, persist in thinking of ourselves as one, we condemn ourselves with the truly white nations to sterility and decadency, unquote. One of the major points I want to make in my presentation is that because racism and racialized thinking have become so commonplace and normalized in America, we often engage in racial common sense thinking. 
Racial common sense thinking is the act of overlooking, overlooking or covering over the striking advantage of white privilege and the realities of institutionalized racism. It is often the justification that decidedly gives whites the advantage of upper hand in a given social context or that disadvantages non-whites. As a way of thinking, racial common sense thinking benefits the status quo in terms of social relations and denies the lived experience of non-whites. The systematic and economic benefit of institutionalized racism has led to a country steeped in racial common sense thinking as a normalized part of thought, discourse, and practice. Finally, racial common sense thinking is void of the consideration of race and racism as real and meaningful expressions of the American cultural experience for all people of color, including whites. Using a historical example of racial common sense thinking, Frederick Douglass, and he's no longer with, with us, complained in a meeting with Abraham Lincoln about the treatment of black soldiers during the Civil War. Douglas lamented black Union Army soldiers were paid less, undersupplied in comparison to white soldiers and often placed at, at the front line, which resulted in a quick death during many fights. Lincoln simply replied that such treatment was the price that black troops paid for being allowed to fight in the Civil War. A present day example we can find, in a present day example of racial common sense is the long running narrative of American drug use during the crack cocaine epidemic, which predominantly affected urban black communities. Crack cocaine users and addicts were stereotyped as hypersexual predators and who were overly violent. The 1986 Federal Anti Drug Abuse Act led to mandatory minimum prison sentencing for dealers and those who committed violent acts related to the use of crack cocaine. This was a highly controversial issue because it changed the system of federal supervision release from a rehabilitative system into a punitive system with mandatory sentencing guidelines. Conversely, today, we are witness to an opioid epidemic which has captured the attention of the entire nation and has killed many more people than crack cocaine did. Yet, because it's associated with people from, from all backgrounds, and mainly because it is because of its dramatic effects on affluent white families, it is viewed as a medical emergency. Now, as it should have been in the past, treatment is the order of the day. Relations between races are relations between places. In other words, physical space is needed for racism to take place. Not just on Sunday mornings, racialized space shaped nearly every aspect of our life, states George Lipset in, in his text, How Racism Takes Place. Seldom is the story told of race and spatial relations. By examining residential and school segregation, mortgage and insurance redlining, taxation and transportation policies, the location of environmental and toxic hazards, policing strategies, and the design of highways and byways, we can gain an understanding of all the spatial ways in which racism takes place. Location and sites works together to, to produce and sustain racial meaning. Seemingly race neutral locations contain hidden racial assumptions and imperatives about spatial relations. Prior to present day relationships between race and space at the, at the state, local, and community level, the romanticized frontier was deemed free territory, open for the flourishing of e uh, endless economic growth with democratic capitalism as a form of government. Frontier in individualism created a narrative that justified the continued expansion of the country, viewing the land as opportunity to be conquered and indigenous people as barbaric and in need of civilization or extermination. In the immediate period after the Civil War, Northerners and Southerners agreed on little and found rare common ground, but they agreed on the need to work collaboratively on manifest destiny to remove Western tribes and Mexicans in the expansion of U.S. territory. At the end of the post-Civil War Reconstruction in 1877, thousands of Northerners and Southerners were sent to fight Native Americans for the purpose of expanding U.S. territory. Although nearly 30,000 Native Americans fought in the Civil War, between 1865 and 1891, there were 13 different campaigns and over 1,000 separate battles against the Cheyenne, Crete, Chicktaw, Navajo, Lakota, Sioux, Seminoles, and other tribes. 
With the end of Reconstruction and the enactment of Jim Crow across every southern state, the U.S. federal government sent troops to Cuba, Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico in order to take these territories from Spain. The rhetorical message to start the war was based on liberating downtrodden and desperate people from tyrannical governments. Prior to the War of 1889, there was no mention of race as a backdrop in the desire to feed the Spanish. Have the war rekindled U.S. Civil War sentiments for the, for the Southern lost cause? As an occupying force with no enemy on which to focus attention, letters from American newspapers and soldiers started to comment on the color of the people they were sent to liberate. First in the 1898 campaign and then in Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, there were notably similar narratives written to families and friends stating, quote, how they would shoot niggers, lynch niggers, release niggers into the swamp to die, water torture niggers, and use niggers as target practice. Now, I don't like the N-word. I use that to make it. I think some of the young folks have bumped their head somewhere and saying that it, you know, it means something else. So don't say anything funny out to me in the hallway. So, all right. Racism and immigration requires a critical examination of historical and present-day dynamics in terms of understanding national ideology, sentiment, policy, and practice as they pertain to race and racism. For example, the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo to end the Mexican and American War awarded the United States, California, Nevada, Utah, and parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. The treaty stated that people of Mexican descent within, within these territories could choose to stay and become U.S. citizens. The remaining Mexican people hoped that the newly annexed territory would become a bicultural free republic that was bilingual. What happened was a heavy dose of American frontier expansion. As one newspaper during the time put it, it was time to recognize that Anglo-Americans and Mexicans were different and the two people could not live together. Mex Mexicans were forcibly expelled and removed from nearly the rest of the century. White settlers had no compulsion in dispossessing as many Mexicans as they could, clearing them from whole regions just as done to Native Americans. The Texas Rangers represented the government's vigilante killing of Indians, mestitos, and of Mexicans indiscriminately during the 100-year reign of terror from the mid-1830s to 1935. Mexicans along the Rio Grande were lynched, shot, and often killed without provocation. For more than a century, the American frontier represented a universal declaration of progress and prosperity that would transform the brutality of racial regulation into something noble. Authors of the new ideology justified continued American expansion claimed that fractionalism, regionalism, racial, raci racism, and differences about how to promote prosperity for all would be solved with continued economic growth. Today, with no new geographic frontier to incorporate, a large percentage of the U.S. population calls for more border walls and a host of travel restrictions to keep out unwanted immigrants. Acknowledging that countries have a right and responsibility to guard their borders, the building of a border wall represents panic among the power class, writes author Gray Reagan in his text, The End of Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall, in the mind of America. There are now border zones set up all over the country, including airports, and we now have returned to detention camps for unwanted non-white immigrants. In fact, U.S. defense analysts and the Pentagon maintain that all of Central and South America and the Caribbean are peripheral U.S. borders. Walls are on the upswing, protecting the rich in Rio de Janeiro, containing Palestinians in the West Bank, separating India from Bangladesh, Greece from Turkey, and Belfast Catholics from Protestants. Even the White House, the so-called People's House, is having a wall built around it. Walls represent familiarity with our racialized past and our continued reliance on racial common sense thinking. A reduced frontier and the diminished absence of free labor for the ruling class has resulted in a growing and pervasive use of dog whistle politics that have resulted in the vocal and demonstrative claim shouted during the Trump administration quote, make America great again. A panic has emerged among American citizens and political classes because of the growing inability, inevitable movement to the minority majority in America. 
We have moved from the notion of angry black man to that of angry white man, and we are witnessing increased racialized tension and tribalism worldwide. Chants of blood and soil, anti-immigration of non-whites here in America, ethnic and religious tension in India, and the development of white nationalism and supremacy groups throughout Europe makes race and inter-ethnic tension a battle cry for the ruling class and those who see material limits in the future. All the things that expansion was supposed to preserve have been destroyed, and all the things that it was meant to destroy are preserved. Instead of peace, there is endless war. Instead of critical, a critical, resilient, and progressive citizenry, citizenry a conspiratorial nihilism rejecting reason and dreading change has taken hold. Racism was never transcended, and although the civil rights movement led by African Americans was a major milestone in terms of forging greater opportunity for many oppressed groups, the country has spent a great amount of energy and capital to create and maintain structural inequalities based on the relationship between race and space. As for the social work profession, it has its own challenges with race and racism throughout the history of the profession. On the subject of research on race and racism in social work today, there's little in the form of empirical studies. Much of the research on race and racism is in the area of cultural competency, which has a drift of rigorous research studies. Nevertheless, there are efforts taking place within universities and social work education programs that address community-based needs for racialized people through programming and practices. In recent years, race and racism are viewed as part of intersectional approaches to reducing oppression, discrimination, and multiple forms of bias. Of course, the field of intersectionality is important to understand as, as it has added a much needed perspective that expands our understanding of client identities and, oppressed pra and oppressive practices. Yet, according to economic and genetic studies, the poorest people in America today and throughout its history are the darkest people within the country those with the most West African DNA, in other words, black people. Because of this, social work scholar Jerome Shirley argues that a race-centered perspective is needed throughout the social work profession. A basic assumption, a basic assumption of the race-centered perspective is that a key function of American social policy development is implementation and social control the policies and practices that emerge from the underlying assumption of social control and are understood as having regulatory intention and results that aim to monitor and change the behavior of those deemed socially deviant or politically threatening. From this viewpoint, social policies are instruments that enforce the cultural norms and mores of dominant groups among those who demonstrate nonconformity. Thus, a race-centered framework is needed throughout the social work profession in order to first understand the problem of white, of being white, black, brown, Jewish, of Middle Eastern descent, Native American, Asian American, and just being plain American. Placing race at the center of our analysis moves moving, moving from a non-racist perspective to an anti-racist practice. There's a distinct difference between not being racist and being an anti-racist. Just because people do not believe that they are racist says nothing of their ability to identify and locate the roots of racism within power and policies, which leads to programs, practices, and personal interactions, the task of the anti-racist. To not be a racist is a position of neutrality. To the contrary, Ibram Kente states that there is no neutrality in, in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist, it is anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in a group of people as a, as a racist or locates the root of the problem in power and policy as an anti-racist. People either allow racial inequities to exist or they take action to produce equality. Finally, the problem with just being not racist is that we live in a world where people are okay with the existence of racism. They just don't want to be known individually as racist. If one critically thinks about it, it would be odd if there was a contagious smallpox epidemic and the person you just informed stated, well, I don't have smallpox. You see, freedom from something is a great deal, but it is not enough. It is much less than freedom for something. 
It is structural inequalities and racial regulation that students must understand how to dismantle if the academy and social education in particular are interested in teaching social justice in a multicultural society in order to teach students about structural change, inclusion, and diversity, and social justice, a concerted change will be needed in social work education. As stewards of social justice, there's a need to teach students how to end exploitation, combat structural inequalities, reduce the trappings of the prison industrial complex, engage in smart decarceration, reduce extreme economic inequality, end the problem of social isolation, promote asset building, and eliminate health inequalities and homeless, homelessness. In taking on these grand challenges and others, it is, it is paramount that students learn how to reduce modern day forms of oppression, racial regulation, power and right privilege as a means of cultivating social justice. Although the use of anti-racist perspective has history within the social work profession, particularly on the East Coast, there's a need for greater focus on anti-racism within the profession. However, as social work scholar Johnny Hamilton Mason and Samantha Snyder write, quote, one of the more general barriers is students' resistance and students' feelings of discomfort, including guilt, shame, and anxiety when discussing anti-racism in the classroom. Along with student resistance and discomfort comes faculty on these, such as the concern that faculty teaching anti-racism can lead to negative course evaluations, unquote. These scholars identify the need for research on anti-racism within the profession to include critical intention across design, implementation, evaluation, accountability, and openness to process. They conclude that an anti-racist commitment requires continuous engagement, connection, challenge, learning, and teaching in a curriculum that is fluid, flexible, proactive, and responsive. I close by returning to the work of James Baldwin he stated that people are not extremely anxious to be equal, equal to what and to who, but they love the ideal of being superior. Most of us really don't have the desire to be free. Freedom is hard to bear. Again, freedom from something is great, but it is not enough. It is much less than freedom for something. If we really are stewards of social justice and anti-racist practices, we must challenge ourselves. As Baldwin states, we are capable of bearing a great burden once we discover that burden is reality and arrive where reality is at. We must earn our death by confronting the passions of the conundrums of life, he stated. He goes on to say, if we can accept ourselves as we are, we might bring new life to Western achievements, transforming them and ourselves into something much more better and something much more beautiful than we've known in the past. Again, as stewards of social justice, we cannot just write articles and books about so social justice seemingly flickering around the flames like moths. Instead, we must take a deep dive into the flame by ending oppression and engaging in anti-racist thought, policy formation, and practice. Finally, using the words of Mary McLeod Bethune, we are as custodians of a great legacy, that is, social work, and we must honor that legacy with strength, dignity, and determination. And in the words of Dr. King, I can't be what you want me to be until you become what I want you to be, and you can't be what I want you to be until I, want you, until I become what you want me to be. That's the essence of reciprocity, which is the essence of the social work profession. Thank you. So as I was putting together this presentation about a week and a half ago, I was sitting in my bed, as I usually do. It's my favorite place to work. And, uh, I, was wa and I had the TV on in the background. It was CNN. And there was a retros retrospective of Trump's presidency. And as I was sitting there going through the evidence, trying to come up with convincing evidence for why racism is important in this world, about halfway through that retrospective, I said to myself, do I really need to do this? I mean, is this really necessary at this point in our lives and in this point in this country? And, uh, you know, as much as I almost wanted to just stop working at that point and say, no, don't worry, we can just show that retrospective, you know? Uh, I did decide to put together some slides for you and uh, prepare a little talk for you. So one of the, you know, one of the uh, reasons why we're, we're presenting on this topic is because we really want to highlight the role of racism as it, uh, 
as it pertains to social work and also how it, how it can be integrated into our grand challenges of social work and, and particularly um, looking at ways in which we can not only just integrate but also to highlight race and racism as a major social problem that social work needs to, work, needs to deal with. Um, I am the co-lead for the uh, Close the Health Gap Grand Challenge, and so um, today I'll be talking primarily around racism and health. I was very, very fortunate when I graduated uh, from the University of Washington and I went to the University of Michigan for my postdoc. I had a, a, a mentor, some of you may know him, Sheldon Danzinger, who um, who had a conversation with me and he, he kind of, you know, I'm not a poverty person and he's a poverty researcher and he kind of looked at me like, you know, I'm probably not the best person to, you know, work with you as closely as, as you probably would want. So I'm going to send you to somebody uh, who has done a lot more work in this area. And he sent me to David Williams. Um, how, how much more fortunate can one be, you know? and, and and so my talks, my talk is 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 somewhat influenced by him, and there's going to be some overlap with his his talk as well, but that that really has nothing to do with me just plagiarizing him as much as it is uh, uh, how much I love his work and how much I'm honored to uh, to be to be a mentor of his or mentee of his. So, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a little bit about racism and health provide you with what I hope is convincing evidence and to then talk about some possible solutions for how we can deal with these things. So the first thing that um, I learned about racism that I think was mind-blowing for me at the time because I couldn't really think of how, how can we connect racism uh, in a way that people really can understand, uh, in a way that uh, makes sense and has some theoretical grounding. And uh, that's one of the first lessons I learned from David was race is a stressor. Now, racism is a stressor. And in fact, um, utilizing Cohen's stress and coping model, we can similarly make the same connections that he makes between stress, coping, health, and uh, mental health outcomes as well. There's various ways in which racism acts as a stressor. Uh, I'm going to describe three here. One is attitudinal or ethnic attitudinal racism or ethnic prejudice, uh, which is used to denigrate individuals or groups because of their ethnic group affiliation or phenotypic characteristics. Behavioral racism or ethnic discrimination. Uh, in contrast, it's any act or on, of an individual or institution that denies equitable treatment to an individual or group based on phenotypic characteristic or ethnic group affiliations. Um, so there are also uh, uh, distinguishing characteristics between both acute sources of perceived discrimination as well as chronic. And this is important because both have been found to be um, highly toxic in, 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 in many ways, but also in different ways. Um, of course, acute, acute forms of racism would be those uh, kinds of events or slurs that might, might be said directly to you as an individual. Uh, some of the thoughts around that is that, you know, while it can impact you, while it can hurt you, while it can uh, make you feel terrible at, in the moment, that oftentimes when you perceive these kinds of things, you can kind of brush it off as, well, you know, that's just one person. But those chronic, um, ongoing, what we call in the, in the stress literature as daily hassles, is similar to what we would call chronic forms of discrimination or racism, which Philomena Essed wrote about um, in her book on everyday racism. And this is those chronic, everyday kind of things. Those things that sort of jab you in the side, that poke you a little bit here and there. And, and it may be intentional or unintentional, but, but you, you feel it, you perceive it, and there's an ambiguity around it where you don't actually really know, okay, was that racism or not, right? And then, you know, oftentimes that's followed by um, an invalidation. Oh, well, you know, that person's just having a bad day or this or that. And, and, and these are the forms of racism that really start to, start to pile up and, and accumulate over time and form uh, uh, the kinds of stresses that, that really can impact people's health. Um, 
There's also uh, microaggressions, which many of you have probably have heard about. I'm not gonna talk about microaggressions today, but um, I do have a book that just came out last year on microaggressions that you all should read. Um, and please purchase if you choose to do so. <laughs> um, so let me talk about racism and health, okay? Um, so basically what we have documented is that racism or discrimination has been found to be associated with a whole range of disease outcomes, uh, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, and many others, as well as preclinical indicators of disease that are not uh, related, that are not dependent upon um, self-report, and that is allostolic load, inflammation, body mass index, incident obesity, and coronary uh, calcification, cortisol dysregulation. Uh, so there's a, a lot of evidence that shows that not only uh, health outcomes, but also health uh, indicators for health. Uh, discrimination has also been shown to be positively associated with depression and anxiety, as well as psychological distress as measured by the DSM. So it's not just health, but it's mental health as well. And finally, discrimination is also associated with comorbidity, whereas compared to individual with, individuals with no disorders, everyday, everyday discrimination, so again, that chronic form of discrimination is associated with two-fold risk of having two or more disorders and three-fold risk of having uh, three or more disorders. I think this is the one that you know, really kind of catches people at their heartstrings, uh, that racism impacts kids as well. Um, children are directly affected by racism through their parents' experience. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I, I, I said this earlier in a presentation earlier, but when I was a, a, young, a young child, you know, I recall seeing Native Hawaiian people on TV protesting the bombing of our, one of our islands, Kaho'olawe, by the military as mil through mil for, for, you know, military testing. Uh, so much so that they destroyed the water table of the island and it's no longer inhabitable. Um, and I remember my father commenting and saying things like, you know, um, those stupid Hawaiians, why are they, you know, why are they doing this? They're making, they're making us look bad, you know, and things like that. And these are the messages that you internalize, right? You know, you start to internalize them over a while. And it's not, so it's not just racism, but it's also internalized racism. It's horizontal racism or lateral racism as well that impacts us too. And it can impact us from very, very early age as kids. Um, maternal discrimination is associated with child social and emotional behavioral outcomes as well. And mother, mother's discrimination has been found to be associated not only with poorer maternal health, but harsher parenting practices. And that both of these factors were associated with child and child social and emotional development. One study, and this is, this is some, of the, some of the new ways that discrimination is coming out, and that's one of the other points that I really wanna make is that one of the reasons why it's so important to study racism and to continue to study racism is because racism changes, you know? Racism that my father experienced is very different from the racism that I experience today, and it's very different from the ex uh, experiences that my children experience today. And one of the ways that people have been uh, one of the new forms of discrimination that has arisen with the rise of the internet era uh, and social media is online discrimination. Uh, that would include things like discriminatory text, images, and symbols directly targeted at individuals because of their race or ethnicity, or even the vicarious online experiences of discrimination where uh, there are derogatory incidences targeted at people who are of your own racial and ethnic group. So, um, there's always new ways, new forms, you know, and, and I imagine that racism will probably be around for a while because it will shift and it will morph, you know, um, as time goes along. We just had our big uh, affirmative action when, as uh, Dean Tinsley was talking about uh, civil rights movements and the advances that we've made and, 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 you know, some of those advances are being reversed, right? Um, and they're continued to be reversed. In, in, in the state of Washington, what was very interesting was where I probably saw most of the, so we just had a, a initiative 1000, which was uh, to, so to speak, bring back 
affirmative action to the state of Washington, and it was defeated uh, quite soundly uh, in the state of Washington, which most would consider to be quite a liberal state. Um, and it was interesting because a lot of the opposition, of course, were not just white folks, but there were Asian folks who were uh, who, who saw uh, affirmative action as not benefiting them because they're not considered underrepresented. You know, and and so when when you when you start to really unpack these things, right? It's it, it it's it's not just one form of racism. It's not just uh, you know derogatory uh, statements made at people. But it's, it's these kinds of incidences that really start to pit us against each other um, when we really should be working together. Finally, racism in healthcare. Um, the Institute of Medicine report by Smedley, which is uh, still quite relevant, although it's been a while since that's been published, uh, goes into great detail on provider bias and, and and, and um, cognitive loads. So I, I wasn't gonna talk as much about this, but I'll just say a couple of words on it. So essentially what happens is providers oftentimes have a lot to deal with in a very short period of time. You know, they have to look at symptoms, they have to, you know, have good bedside manner, they have to do all of these things, and they have to diagnose and they have to come up with treatment within the context of like, what, 15 minutes at most. Right? You're lucky if you get that 15 minutes. That's stressful for people. And what happens when you have a high cognitive load and a very short time to process things, where you start to rely on some of those schemas that you have about people. So, for example, if someone comes in appearing to be highly professional, appearing to have some status within society, and they come in and they, and they have a certain diagnosis or they, they come in with a certain set of symptoms, they may be treated in a certain way. Whereas someone who may come in and may present as say, for example, homeless, or someone who may not have had a bath in a few days, or someone who you know, is not dressed quite as well, that those schemas will also impact the way that uh, that they see the patient and the way that they diagnose the patient and the way that they treat the patient. And so that's been something that has been documented by that Institute of Medicine report. Now additional evidence has been showing that, that these kinds of things are continuing to happen. So we would see things like, for example, there, were, there would be greater, greater numbers of amputations or more evasive treatments for people who are African American as opposed to people who are white who presented the same set of symptoms. So more evasive treatments uh, uh, and things of that nature. In, in, the, in terms of mental health, uh, um, what we see here is, for example, there's a study that demonstrated that black patients received on average one additional dose of psychiatric medication, one additional antipsychotic dose, and one additional half dose of antipsychotic medication by injection. Um, clinicians spent less time to evaluate black patients than white patients. And if you think that, well, some of this can be explained by social class, a uh, study done by, uh, among middle class individuals of, who were both black and white found that, when whites, that, that whites were more likely to get appointments when they asked for appointments than blacks, and that among middle class male, males, white males were more than twice as likely to get an appointment than their black counterparts. So what do we do? Uh, that's probably the, the biggest question here today. Um, well, some of these are also uh, solutions that were offered by David Williams as well, but I, 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 I think I might be able to add some and go a little bit further. One, create communities of, of opportunities to, to seek out individuals where they are at within settings, within communities, within neighborhoods, within places of worship to address health uh, outcomes at those places. So what you see are a lot of uh, interventions being done, not only in, in, in schools, but in churches, in workplaces. Uh, uh, and, and these are also ways to, uh, to address health because they often may occur outside of healthcare systems in which people find oftentimes to be um, perhaps not the most welcoming places. Um, 
Second of all, starting early, um, in trying to address health and health outcomes among youth as early as possible. Third, addressing social determinants of health. A lot of, a lot of the social determinants that impact racism can be alleviated by things like poverty, uh, by alleviating or reducing poverty, enhancing income and employment, improving neighborhood and housing conditions for all people, um, building more health and healthcare delivery. Um, that really refers more to not only providing high quality care for all individuals and access to healthcare for all individuals, but also um, taking a more preventative focus in terms of health and also, um, and also uh, tailoring um, health needs to people's cultures and the context of their patients. Diversifying the workforce. Um, there's a, a high level of distrust that we find among racial and ethnic minorities towards healthcare and healthcare providers, probably because of some of the uh, experiences that they've had within the healthcare system. Um, one way in which we can do that is by providing, by by diversifying our workforce even more so than we've than we've uh, done so so far. Promoting interprofessional education, not only for the sake of, of having integrated teams to address multiple issues, but also uh, when social workers are on a team, social workers come with a specific set of skills and training that other people don't receive. One of them could be issues of social justice and diversity as well as you know, knowledge of racism and the impact of racism. Um, raising awareness of inequalities and building the political will to address them, uh, building that political support you know, we we I I think that's one of the one of the biggest things that um, I can ask people to do is is you know to to really build the political will for change. You know, if 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 we were able to do that, we could have potentially have um, won with the initiative 1000. You know, but uh, um, there really was no political will for that for that to happen. Building critical health literacy skills among individuals and communities. Uh, to increase their influence on a range of social determinants. So um, one of the ways in which we've done that is through the use of patient advocates or community health workers who can not only help link patients uh, to healthcare systems, but also navigate health systems and also provide education outside of the walls of healthcare systems. Train social workers to be in leadership positions and administrative roles. You know, I was just talking to uh, uh, a newly minted dean prior to this, and you know, he was saying that one of the reasons why he wanted to go that route was because he realized after talking about certain issues for over 20 years as a faculty member that he felt he needed to be in an administrative role in order to create real change and to create system change. And, I, and that's true within most systems. Uh, healthcare systems as well, um, and you know, right now we don't train social workers to be leaders in healthcare systems or, or to take, and oftentimes to take on administrative roles. In fact, um, human service management is probably as far as we go in terms of developing leadership and for people in administrative roles. And those are probably, if they're not the smallest programs in our schools, they don't even exist in many schools. You know, the, the whole sort of notion of macro really disappearing from social work has become part of this issue as well, where we really are not training social workers to be administrative leaders. Advancing community empowerment for sustainable health. You know, um, this goes along with the whole notion of CBPR, right? Who, you know, Kurt Lewin, who uh, many of you know uh, for his action research theory, you know, talks about well, you know, when people asked him about action research, he would say, well, we go to the people because the people know what, what the best solutions are. And it's like the people who have the problems have, will know what the solutions are. And, and, and as much as, and although that was, what, 70 years ago or so, or, you know, when, when Lewin was doing his work, you know, we still seem to forget that people who have these, who, who, for whom the problems exist probably know best in terms of how to find solutions. And, and I don't think that we've gone so far as to even ask people what those solutions are. And so working with communities and empowering communities to provide us with uh, solutions I think is necessary. Uh, cultivating innovations in primary care. 
and designing new systems if we cannot fix the old ones. Uh, these are important, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of some of the work that I've been doing in this area. So just in terms of innovations in primary care, um, some of the work that I've been doing in Hawaii is with the uh, community in Waimanalo. And uh, I approached one of the FQHCs there, and I asked uh, the director, Mary Oneha, um, you know, how can I be of help? What are you folks doing? What, what, you know, what would you like to know more about? What would you like to study? And what she told me was, well, we have this program where we're integrating Native Hawaiian healing practices into primary care as part of an interprofessional team. And I was like, what? That is cool. And I said, you know, do you want to do some research around that? And she was like, yeah, we'd like to do some research around that. So we started looking at it, and, and this model really, so every patient who comes into the clinic sees not only a behavior, uh, not only sees a primary care provider, but a behavioral specialist and a primary, uh, and, and a uh, native healer, okay? So that's the team that goes in on the first visit to meet with the patient. And then at that point, a treatment plan is designed around whether or not people want to receive uh, uh, native healing practices or not. Um, and uh, something is put together, you know, a plan is put together that, that combines all of these elements. And it was interesting because when I first started doing this research and talking to providers, providers would tell me, well, you know, they, weren't, they wouldn't say that they were skeptical, but they would be like, you know, there's very limited evidence for this, and, you know, I'm really not sure, you know, if, 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 you know, about all of these things, but because, you know, we're doing it, I'm going to give it a try, and we'll see how things go. By the end of the first year, they were true believers. They were like, yeah, patients come back, you know, which is probably the biggest thing, right? Patients don't come back, you know, or patients don't even show up. For appointments. That's probably the biggest issue. Patients come back. They're on time for their appointments. They're, they, and they don't want to see the provider. They want to see the healer. You know? And I think that they realize how much they've learned about culture, how much they've learned about indigenous knowledge systems, and, and they start to become believers in this. You know? and, and so, you know, just so that you know that this isn't some kind of um, magical kind of thing or something, uh, this, this is an image of our healer. <laughs> Her name's Lenala Bright. She's a normal woman, you know. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't have like, you know, things hanging, you know. She, she's not what you might think of as a healer, but she's our healer. Uh, and this is one of the classes that we have on plant-based medicines. So we work not only on providing those healing services within the clinic, but outside of the clinic, we provide classes that teach people how to take care of themselves uh, through plant-based medicines. Second project I won't say too much about, but this is a project where we um, um, provide backyard aquaponic systems to people in the Waimanalo community where they raise fish in the tanks below and grow plants in the uh, uh, beds above. And what happens is the, the poop from the fish gets pumped up through into the plants to the rock bed where it gets filtered, provides plants with nutrition, and then sends the water back into tank for free wa uh, fresh water. And what happens is uh, this provides not only a healthy, uh, highly nutritious, organic food, a food source for these individuals, but it also provides fresh fish for people to eat. Um, many of the foods that we introduce are traditional foods as well. So getting people back to eating their traditional foods, uh, foods that people ate when we were healthy people. Um, and it also provides a greater, great sense of community among p people. So we bring 10 families together, we work together, we build systems together. And those, then we create Facebook groups so that they can communicate and say, hey, what's that little spot on my plant? You know, can anybody help me? And they provide support for each other. So we create community. We are addressing an issue of food source. Uh, it is also very efficient in terms of water. Um, and it also provides uh, uh, food for people within uh, a food desert, which is what Waimanalo, the community of Waimanalo is, and it's about 50% Native Hawaiian, and it's uh, um, got probably about a 30% poverty rate. Um, and so 
you know, again, this is an, just a couple of examples of how we can create new innovations within healthcare and primary care systems, but also creating our, our own systems and working outside of systems and taking a more preventative approach to health with our communities. And with that, I uh, say thank you. It is a privilege to be here. Again, my name is Melissa Bartholomew, and I am a PhD student at Boston College. And I first want to thank the committee for inviting us to present here today, and um, my colleagues for inviting me to co-present with them. We are here as a part of a collective effort that has started um, a number of years ago, a movement to center the work of race and racism in social work, and specifically, we're arguing for a 13th grand challenge, racism to be centered as a 13th grand challenge. So I am so grateful to be a part of this movement, this collective movement. I want to acknowledge my colleagues and friends from BC who are also a part of this movement and who stand here with me in spirit. And I am centered and rooted in an African-centered worldview that compels me to also give thanks and acknowledge my ancestors, those who have come before me, those whose land we are on, the indigenous peoples of this land, those who were brought here, enslaved over 400 years ago, but for the free labor and the free land, we would not have the country that we have. So I wanna take a moment to just give thanks and honor the shoulders upon whom we stand, all those oppressed people, and even the people in this facility who are working to support this event behind the scenes. I want to give thanks for those who are nameless, who are invisible, who create us spaces of comfort so that we can talk and engage about how to eliminate oppression. So thank you. As I was thinking and preparing and praying about this talk, what struck me was a number of things. One, I think when we talk about race and racism, we often don't really talk about what it is. We kind of talk around it. We talk about the impact. We talk about laws and policy and so forth, but we don't talk about what it is, what it does, what its function. And essentially, race, racism, was created to separate us to cause a disconnection. So when we're talking about racism, we're talking about a rupture, a rupture in human relationships. And then when we're talking about anti-racism and anti-racist practices, we're talking about the very delicate yet important work of repair. So rupture and repair. And we've heard from the speakers before me, and we know we're not doing enough of a job, enough of a good job in this field of social work, in our research in centering this work. There have been a number of articles written, studies done, um, content analyses that proves this. So my question is, what is it going to take for us to eradicate racism? Hence the title of my talk, Eradicate, Eradicating Racism from Within. So in the course of my research, I discovered that Dr. Larry Davis, a retired dean of the School of Social Work in Pittsburgh, spoke very eloquently on this topic right here in DC in 2016. He was a presidential um, lecturer and talked about racism, not only as a grand challenge for social work, but as America's grand challenge. And I saw that he uh, underscored many of the points that I was planning to share today. So he's in the room with us. I don't know if he's here right now, but I'm bringing his voice in the room. So the ongoing question, what will it require of us as social workers, as social work researchers, to address racism and not only to address it, because we're not talking about managing it or coping with it, but to eradicate it. Number one, a willingness to be uncomfortable. So Dr. Davis says, I believe 
but in our efforts to be inclusive. Social work professionals have lost our way with regards to the issue of race and racism. Meaningful discussions on topics of race get lost in the more comfortable and less anxiety-arousing discussion of diversity. A willingness to be uncomfortable, to have those difficult conversations in our classrooms, in our boardrooms, in our faculty rooms, those difficult conversations with ourselves. Because you see, the work of repair actually begins with the rupture in ourselves. So I contend, as others do, that before we start talking about racism and addressing racism and centering it in social work, actually alongside the conversation of centering race and racism in social work, we have to also talk about the work of centering the work of anti-racism, dismantling racism within ourselves. So an ongoing pra uh, practice of self-examination, self-reflection, to discern our biases, to discern the ways in which we have internalized racism and white supremacy, that has to be a part of the work ongoing. That's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. So I love uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. There is a, he's all around my little office where I work at home. He's one of my ancestors that's guiding me, I know. And I went to him for words on this and was led directly to, this is uh, the study that he, the absolutely brilliant study, the Philadelphia Negro study. It was a study of over 40,000 Negroes we were called Negroes back then, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, published in 1899. 1899, the statistical study. This is the study. So this is Dr. Du Bois, of course, the premier, premier African-American sociologist. This is what he says, and this is how he cautions researchers. And this is in the opening of the study. And it's under the section entitled, The Credibility of the Results. This is what his caution is, to researchers. The best available methods of sociological research are at present so liable to inaccuracies that the careful student discloses the results of individual research with diffidence. He knows that they are liable to error from the seemingly eradicable faults of the statistical method to even greater error from the methods of general observation and above all, he must ever tremble lest some personal bias, some moral conviction, or some unconscious trend of thought due to previous training has to a degree distorted the picture in his view. So if Dr. Du Bois in 1899 can caution researchers about the need to make sure that we are examining ourselves with the understanding that our worldview, the way we've been socialized, seeps into our research, seeps into our practice, seeps into our analysis. Certainly, it's true today. So, the self-examination work is critical. It's also critical, I believe, to cast a vision. When we were having our conversations about this work, uh, my colleagues laughed at me because I uh, talked about hope and having a vision. And uh, I, I said I believe that we need to, as social workers, make sure that we identify our target and we cast a vision of a world healed of racism. And I um, just want to go real quickly. Dr. Davis also believes the same. In that same speech, he said, Social work researchers are the best positioned of any researchers in America to make enormous contributions to efforts to ameliorate racism in America. We are uniquely positioned because of the work that we do, the interdisciplinary work that we do, and most importantly because of our code of ethics that requires that we uphold human dignity, self-worth of all individuals, that we examine race, ethnicity, biases, all of this is what we are required to do. It's in our codes of ethics. So we have an ethical responsibility to not only examine racism and to address it, but to cast a vision for a new way, a new world. And I believe that if we don't get to the root, 
if we don't characterize this work as a work of healing, we're gonna just see, as Michael said, racism changes over time. We're just gonna see racism manifesting in different ways. And an example, which we all know, which is really makes this point clear, we know that the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but we also know that it also set up a system for a new form of slavery. The 13th Amendment, in nothing since, has actually explicitly stated the intention of eradicating racism, of even addressing racism or healing from its effects. So this, was, this is what happens when we lack the ability and the will to actually frame the work and actually be intentional about getting to the root. We just continue to see racism manifesting and remanifesting in harmful ways. So the last thing I'll say, this is a call. When I first started in the program, I remember quite clearly that I was struck by the fact that there was not a specific grand challenge that addressed racism. And I was excited that there were others already thinking about this. This is part of the consciousness. I was excited about working with my colleagues at BC on this. And I'm grateful to stand here as a part of a movement, as a part of a collective with colleagues who embody racial justice. And there's an urgency for us to do more. There's an urgency. As I said, Dr. Davis said all this right here in DC in 2016. So there's an urgency for us to continue to not only talk about it, but actually internalize it to make sure that we're not talking about this in four years. I believe this is a generational call, and the reason why I believe it's important to have hope and that even though it seems that racism is something that we can never get rid of, I come from a people who had hope. Stacey Abrams talked about hope. I share that hope. It's in the DNA. It's been passed down. It's generational hope. So this is a picture of my grandfather, Reverend Marcus Garvey Wood, who is 99 years old, Lord willing, he'll see 100 in June. And for the last 80 plus years, our family has been going to our family reunion, we call it homecoming. And it's in a small part of Virginia called Wear Neck. Wear Neck was a black settlement um, in Virginia, not too far from Jamestown. So my grandfather, has written a book about his life and ministry, and in that book uh, includes information about his grandmother uh, and his grandfather, Susan and Moses Wood, who were enslaved. And so the picture on, our, the, the, on the other side is a picture of Susan, my grandmother Susan's um, gravestone. And that's one summer a couple years ago when we went to the gravesite. This is a, a, a cemetery that was just for black people. So Susan died in 1925. My grandfather was a small child, but remembers her, her very clearly. Susan was a woman of faith, her husband Moses was a man of faith, and they believed that even if they didn't see freedom, even if they, if they didn't live long enough to see uh, black people liberated to a certain status, they held the hope, they held the belief, the vision, that that day would come. So I have a responsibility to carry forth that call and that vision for my child and for my child's child and my child's child. And I offer this picture not only because of hope, but also as a critical reminder that we're not that far away from slavery. And we're not that far away from the genocide of Native Americans, because my family is also uh, a descendant of, of Powhatan, um, the Powhatan tribe in Virginia. So I have a living relative whose relatives were Native American, whose relatives were enslaved, who is still alive and well in Baltimore, Maryland. So the distance between that time is not that long. The psychological difference is even shorter. So if we don't get to the heart of the matter, if we don't get to the work of transforming our consciousness and getting to the root, which is the environment that allowed for people to be enslaved, the environment that allowed for the land to be stolen, and the current environment that allows for children to be caged at the border, if we don't get to the heart of the matter and heal the consciousness that has continued to reproduce this violence, we're gonna keep talking about this year after year. So I submit that as social workers, 
Our work is the work of head and heart together. Our work is a work of critical reflection that must go alongside the research and the numbers. Because the thing about Dr. Du Bois, which I just learned about, I just learned about this study a couple years ago from a class I sat in. Um, and I learned also about his frustration. I mean, this is, you know, a huge study. And he was frustrated because he believed that with all the data, it still wasn't enough for white people to really understand the problem of the Negro. So I submit that the numbers are important and data is important. Data are important. But what's also important is that we examine ourselves and we examine the context that has allowed these conditions to flourish. And that work begins within. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa and Michael. We have time, I think about 15 minutes or so here or less uh, for questions, uh, not stump speeches, but questions. And I would just ask that uh, you go to, there are two microphones in a room, one there and one there. Fun. Yeah. My name is uh, Neil Abel, and I want to thank you for a wonderful spectrum of ideas and a very comprehensive approach to the issue. Um, in the mindfulness work that I'm engaged in, there is uh, a, a statement that goes, when conditions are sufficient, something will arise. And if we are unconscious of our contribution to a problem such as racism, we may perpetuate that problem. If we become more conscious, we may be part of a remedy. My question is, um, from the perspective that we may need to commit ourselves to circumstances we don't hope to outlive, do you think we can succeed in this grand challenge in, with incremental approaches, or do you think we need a revolution? It really depends on what type of revolution you're talking about. If you uh, are talking about a revolution of violence, it will be a race war. And as I understand America and its gun culture, we know who owns most of the guns. So that doesn't work well. Uh, we do need the revolution of ideals in terms of teaching. Um, and part of my piece was just what you said in understanding how racial common sense impacts us in the everyday ordinary, the grand challenges and how we live. But we don't see that. I mean, it's really tearing us apart. There's anger all over the world based on differences from some stuff that started a couple of centuries back. Uh, and now Mother Earth is calling, saying, this thing doesn't work for me either. But we're blinded by the whites, uh, to put a pun in there, in terms of our inability to deal with this problem and its exhaustive impact on our society. Uh, so while there's hope and we don't know what the future looks like, uh, we certainly need a revolution in terms of our change of consciousness. We need a revolution in terms of our thoughts and ideals. What will trigger that? I mean, uh, if we look at the environment, just going astray for a moment, we've had massive fires. What happened in Australia, New, Ze New Zealand was dark for a couple of days. And if that doesn't get your attention, a year or two ago, we had people roasted in cars in California. If that doesn't get your attention in terms of the environment and denial, uh, then I don't know what does. And so while there is hope, there is a need for more consciousness. But again, as I said, it, part in terms of race, it is the examination of whiteness that we really, really need to deal with. And so the reciprocity in terms of that has lots of meanings. We had a speaker here the other day that called for money. Well, you know, there are about 35 million black people in this country. $35 million is chump change in terms of the problems that black people have. So money is not the only issue. It is to repair, not just 
the people that this happened to, but ourselves. Karl Marx wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln after the Civil War. And he said, look, uh, I know you guys uh, like this slavery thing and it was working out well for you, but how did you like kill a half a million of each other over this? Your own people. And so we've never dealt with such questions. That's why I positioned my paper the way I did. And so there are several frontiers that we need to have a, a revolution about. How we get there, what we do as a profession, I'll stop there. I don't, I don't use a microphone usually. Um, my name is Charity Watkins. I'm a professor at North Carolina Central University. I believe I'm the first one from my institution to be here at SWAR, um, a historically black college. Um, my question is, as I look at the um, title of SWAR's conference this year, the first thing I thought was, how do we reduce social economic or economic inequality when it costs $425 to attend? How do we um, reduce racial inequalities when oftentimes the representation in the room, there's not many people who look like me? This year, yes, good job. But <laughs> not on the usual basis. So my question in, in, in total is, are we the right people to have this conversation with? And if so, who are we missing in terms of voices? I think it's, it's great that we're having this conversation and that the committee, um, the planners for this conference are, are giving us this space. And at the same time, there are you know, challenges that you, you raised, the academic challenges are real. The other thing that is glaring to me, this is only my second time uh, attending, and each time when we register and you have to check off the box, your area of, I, don't, I have to fill in the blank because racism is nowhere to be found. So how does that comport with what we're trying to do? If it's not even itemized as an area of research, not even racial disparities, that is, I was shocked the first time. And then I thought this year, okay, well clearly it's, it's gonna be there this year. I was shocked, again, that I had to fill in racism. So it's a parallel process, and it speaks to what the other question was, you know, I, two lessons I learned a couple years ago, you know, that you have to keep the long view while you're working to meet the goal and get it done at the same time. So this is part of getting it done while we're keeping the long view. So we're compassionately critical about what needs to be done while we're also keeping the long view and moving it forward. Thank you for your question. If you will stay, because this question is for you. <laughs> uh, my name is Parthena Luke Robinson. I'm a doc student at um, University of South Carolina. Hi. Um, and I'm hoping you can speak a little bit to, I, I noticed on your slides that um, I'm probably guessing in the interest of time, you had to skip over critical race theory. Yeah. And so I would like for you to speak, if, if possible, a little about yes. what you think the role of critical race theory will be in this movement within um, the context of social work. Sure, thank you. Yeah, yes, critical race theory, I mean, a, a, a brilliant cadre of legal scholars um, in the 80s, you know, Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, realized that there was a need for the law to make sure that race was centralized in the legal analysis um, to balance the dominant discourse. And it's the same requirement for us in social work. And what it does, what the, my slide said was, not only does it uh, encourage us to center race in the discourse, in our analysis, in our practice, in our research, but also within ourselves. And framing, Kim Kimberly Crenshaw also said in a TED talk I heard of hers recently, she when she was talking about intersectionality, she talked about the importance of framing. And if you don't frame the conversation correctly, if you don't frame the analysis correctly, you're gonna miss something. So if we don't frame the analysis, and include race and racism, we're gonna miss it. So critical race theory grounds us and it calls us and compels us to stay focused on the fact that we're not gonna get anywhere to justice unless we go through race and racism. Social justice, 
You got to get through it. You can't avoid it. So that's what I believe it does for us. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for being here. My name is Kiana Brown, and I'm an assistant professor at the Rutgers School of Social Work. I address health equities and disparities in my research, including disparities by race, as I'm examining prenatal substance use. At the same time, and I'm going to continue to do the work because I'm called to do it. No matter if I'm at a university, at a nonprofit, wherever, I'm going to do the work. While I'm doing the work, I'm also feeling the wear and tear of being black in America. I'm afraid to drive back and forth to work in fear of being stopped by the police. I have four degrees. Yes. I've been trained at Hopkins, yes. Columbia, and the top schools in the nation. I'm afraid to engage with the healthcare system because I'm often disrespected and disregarded. So while I'm, I'm afraid for my husband, mm -hmm. he's a preacher, mm -hmm. he's a minister. When he goes out, I'm afraid if my six foot one husband is going to be stopped by the cops. Yes. And the only hope I have other than my faith is that his skin is a couple of shades lighter than mine. And maybe the police will be easier on him. So while we're doing the work to start the revolution, the research to produce more data, the reality is I'm doing it while black. Yes. Am I collateral damage in this? And if I am, I'm okay with that because like I said, I'm gonna do the work anyway, but I need to just know my position. And right now I don't know it. I know I'm a great scientist because I've been trained to be great, but also nothing protects me from being mm. black here. I'm a veteran, I served my country during 9-11. I have this many degrees. I'm confident in my blackness. I'm proud to be black. But it hurts. It hurts living here. Yes. And I need to know if I'm collateral damage. And if that's true, it, I, I'll accept it. But tell me, please. Mm. Your name again, sister? I'm Kiana Brown. Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wholeheartedly feel you and appreciate you because you've given voice to part of our work as scholars that only people of color are privy to and the depth of the challenges that we bear not from a place of victimhood, victimhood not from a place of you know, oh, woe is me, but the reality of what it costs to live, and in this case in particular as a black woman in the United States of America, is real. And I wholeheartedly appreciate you for expressing that, and I wholeheartedly identify with toll as a mother of a black child, as a wife of a black man, I wholeheartedly identify and appreciate with the tension between peering into the womb of racism, the research, having to think critically, having to do the analysis, having to write the paper, and then dealing with the grief, the everyday grief, that trigger, that cellular memory, the wounds from our enslaved ancestors, that's real, and then not having adequate care for many of us, mental health care. Fortunately, I have a good counselor, but many of us don't. Adequate clinicians who can help us through and yet be responsible for the work of continuing. So you are not collateral damage. And the reason why I bring up my enslaved ancestors is because we will never understand the depths of their struggle. But what we can understand and try to understand is the mechanisms and the strategies they use to survive. So I'm also a minister, and even if I wasn't, I would still appreciate the tools of spirituality and faith and the connectedness. I forgot in my opening to say the very fundamental work 
of dismantling racism, eradicating racism, and repairing that breach is connecting with each other. And I meant to just ask each other to, to look at each other and just acknowledge one another and say hello to your neighbor, because that connection, that repair, that community, those are sources of support and strength. If I didn't have my BC colleagues, my comrades in the front, if I didn't have them through this journey, I, would not, I couldn't stand here because it's too much. And I got to the point a couple years ago when I decided to be explicit about it because we often walk around and we don't talk about how, how much it is. And to be explicit is an act of self-care. It's a radical act of self-care, like Audre Lorde said. So I appreciate you being explicit and you're not collateral damage. Keep expressing it. Keep doing your work and, and keep expressing and being explicit about the burden that you carry. Thank you. I mean, I, I really can't follow that, but, <laughs> but I do want to say that you're not collateral damage, and in fact, you're an inspiration, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think when we get into these conversations, a lot of times we forget, you know, that uh, we are making progress, you know, um, that, you know, as slow as it may be, it is happening, um, but you're inspiring me, you're ins you will inspire my children, you inspire your children, and our grandchildren, so not collateral damage at all. And uh, as much as probably every person of color in this room uh, knows the pain that you're feeling, you know, um, and sometimes we just forget that uh, um, there there is hope. And and I, and I echo um, Melissa's comments earlier about hope. Um, and what I tell my students every day, you know, is. You know, you don't have to be the bravest person to do this. You don't have to be the most outspoken person on this. But, you know, if you can just do one thing every day, you know, just one thing every day to challenge yourself around your beliefs, uh, stereotypes that you hear, you'd be conscious about who made your clothing, you know. If it's just one little thing. You know, that's something. You know, that's something that will help to relieve the, the, the pain, you know, that, that, that many people of color on this, on this, uh, in this country experience on a daily basis. With that, um, we're over time. So we're going to close this out and say thank you so much for attending. And uh, <clears throat> enjoy your evening. <laughs>